The mobile gaming industry has been going through a number of big changes. We've seen a wave of M&A and consolidation play out over the past four through five years and now starting to wane. We've seen game industry giants battle over the future of app platforms. We've further seen a shift in data privacy policies that significantly impact the ability to target and acquire users. And we have seen the rise of new opportunities in crypto and whatever is meant by this thing people call the metaverse. Today, we have brought together a number of experts from across the gaming ecosystem to have a casual but deep and informal discussion about the future of mobile gaming, especially with respect to both what are key opportunities game developers should be aware of and what are the potential risks as we move into 2022 and beyond. So joining us today, we bring a perspective from game publishing, from a new game startup CEO, and from marketing research and intelligence. So really great and specific, diverse perspectives. And in particular, we have joining us first, Nadav Ashkenazi, who is SVP of Publishing Solutions at IronSource. Second, Ron Rejwan, co-founder and CEO of new gaming startup, Sneaky Panda, who was also former co-founder and CTO of Jelly Button, the makers of Pirate Kings. And finally, Lexi Sidow, head of insights at App Annie. I think you'll definitely find the conversation full of insights as we talk risks and opportunities in 2022 and beyond, starting right now. All right, so I thought we could kick it off with the state of the mobile gaming industry. And in particular, when you think about all of the changes of the past year or two, and we've had a lot of changes in the mobile gaming industry, Wondering if you could each talk about some of the most meaningful or the single most meaningful change you think has occurred that will have the biggest impact over, say, the next five to 10 years. And maybe we could start with you, Nadav. Yeah, sure. Um, five to 10 uh, years from uh, today. So, so first <laughs> of all, I think that uh, it's a big, big, big question, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll speak about it in two different layers. One is the, is the, is the layer that is basic what we have today in the industry and then innovative direction that maybe will take place maybe not so so in general i think that i think that the industry will keep its uh, growth track i think that the fact that uh, there was a lot of of money flowing into the gaming industry in the past year let's mm -hmm. say is going to even uh, accelerate it more right whether it's ipos or investment i think that we are definitely going to see this industry keep growing and even maybe in a higher ratio, uh, at least uh, uh, based on, on, on what happened in the past year. So this is definitely going to happen in my eyes in terms of what we know today, the, the mobile gaming ecosystem. I think that all different uh, genres are going to grow. Like I, I see, I think that we are beyond uh, the iOS 14 changes that were a big question mark about how the industry will look afterward, what will be the growth ratios afterward. I feel that the industry kind of stabilized after uh, the changes and managed to to build and to maintain their their business uh, as usual and to keep the growth that uh, we saw before. So in my eyes, it's uh, it's great news for us. And and I think it's across all different subgenres, right? From hyper casual to, to casual to RPG. I think that in the past year we saw new players entering the market big time and managed to get huge scale and success, which are all great signs. And I think that we'll keep seeing this projection growing even further with new studios stepping in, more consolidation, more acquisitions, more investments. And five years from today, I think that everything will be much bigger than what we have today. On top of that, of course, there are the, the innovative uh, uh, um, directions that maybe will take place or maybe not. Some of them are more uh, uh, intuitive, like uh, whether games will become more uh, platform-based, uh, Apple Arcade will have their own, Facebook will have their own, etc., which is one direction. And some of are, are more new to us, right? Like uh, uh, NFT, Play to Earn, which are a huge buzz. And, and currently, if you, if you listen to the buzz, feels like in five to 10 years from today, this is going to be the industry, right? But uh, I think it's way too early to, to say, but definitely there is value there. I think it definitely it's going to grow. I know if it will take, if it will conquer the entire industry and become the future of mobile games, but I think it will 
be a new offering that uh, will have uh, some interesting uh, uh, things to offer users. So it definitely will take a place, and a lot of a lot of a lot depends on the regulation stuff and how well it will go to the mobile, because as we all to know today, it's very desktop uh, based industry. Right. All the play to earn NFTs and and new ecosystem that is now rising. So so I see bright future for the five ten years. Uh, with our core business today and also new directions that can add more value uh, uh, to what uh, the ecosystem offers today. Hey, what do you think, Ron? Uh, I think I agree with pretty much everything that Dub said. Uh, I think he hit the, hit the nail right, uh, right at the spot, more or less. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess that we're going to see continued growth uh, like we saw year to year, year by year. Um, historically speaking, you also saw that like whenever there's a financial crisis or uh, something at the sort, like entertainment uh, is, was always the, the one field that doesn't get uh, hurt and even vice versa, uh, even like the opposite. Like people want escapism from the reality, so they, they turn to entertainment. So that's why I think we saw like a, a very huge uh, growth uh, the past uh, two years uh, since the corona um, definitely I think I see I think nfts are still very very ripe the the market is very young there and and right now it's it feels more of a sort of a gold rush uh, to me um, but I'm, I'm guessing that we'll see uh, like uh, more I'll call it uh, real implementations of nft and like more proper integrations with game mechanics and, and not just something that's you know tacked on um, and besides that um, yeah it's going to be interesting because I think uh, there's the IDFA change on uh, Google as well right on January if I'm not mistaken so that should be also interesting to see what, what's going to happen five years from now I have honestly I have no idea you know I basically you know who knows well being like six months you know <laughs> and Lexi what do you think yeah, I think, I mean, definitely will echo those sentiments around growth. Um, what we're seeing at Appiani, especially it, when we look at the data and the growth rates um, and the tra trajectory that we're on, it's looking really positive for mobile, especially. Um, when you look at sort of mobile and landscape of all the other gaming formats, so PC, Mac, console, um, handheld, mobile is the biggest growth driver for, for the industry overall. And I think that's sort of last year what we really started to see with some of those more core console-based or PC-based games take that leap into mobile and find it really successful. So like League of, Le League of Legends, Wild Rift, um, that's another really great game to kind of call out where uh, they just passed 150 million spend on the mobile game itself. Um, and it's a big opportunity. So going forward into the next five to 10 years, I think you'll continue to see some of that um, sort of migration to mobile um, and possibly start seeing some of the budgets shift around where you're starting to prioritize the mobile landscape and the mobile gaming opportunity a little bit more um, or equal potentially with some of the console PC titles. Um, so I do think that is really ripe for growth. Um, and I also would say, I think we're really on an interesting path towards the metaverses. And I, you know, we can probably talk about that for days and days, but I do see that that is a really big opportunity. Anything that's going to bring online, um, you know, people together um, in that point, sort of, with your friends and that social aspect um, to the point Ron made about entertainment. And the, during the pandemic, we saw um, games, entertainment, streaming, dating, very resilient, often boosted because people were trying to find escapism or passing the time. Um, and so I think that that's an area that we um, will see that kind of social element seep more into gaming and continue to help drive a lot of that growth, especially um, around sort of multiplayer games on mobile. Great. And so now that we've kind of talked about sort of existing changes and how that could potentially extrapolate into the future, I wanted to shift to the focus of our discussion and trying a little bit of a different format, which is to say that it'd be great if each one of us could bring a specific opportunity and risk, and then we can go around the room and then get everyone's opinions on on what that specific opportunity and risk is, and this will be future opportunity, future risk. And 
Um, and, I, and hopefully we can have some discussion and debate around each. But I thought I, I would go ahead and start with my own. And kind of like, and, and starting with opportunities, I, I thought from my perspective, I see a big opportunity in what I'm calling sort of mid-core and hardcore insurgency. Meaning, like one of the things that we've seen recently is Dream Games, for example, they kind of proved that great operators can win even in like heavily entrenched game markets when, when cracking like the match three game market. And I, I think that, so, so they kind of proved that, you know, great operators can compete in any market, in my opinion. And then on top of that, we have IDFA deprecation, which I think the impact is not as pronounced as, as we may have previously thought, but we do see some impact, for example, in higher spend types of games, like social casinos, seems like there's some impact on downloads, for example. And, and I, would, I would submit that over time, there may be a bigger impact to higher LTV games, just because you lose that ability to target against those categories. And so you could kind of imagine a scenario in which the moat for some of these higher ARPU games would not would become less formidable because you don't have that huge, huge barrier of UA spend against the the higher LTV midcore and hardcore games. And so when we when I think about those two trends, and on top of that, I would say the third thing that I'm saying is that this huge MA wave that we've seen over the last four or five years, right? Whether it was Zynga or some of the consolidators like Still Friend and Embracer, if if we think about the gaming ecosystem in terms of of scale, like small scale, mid scale, large scale, and what we've seen is like the big guys have gobbled up all the smaller guys, and even some of the big guys, bigger guys have swallowed up the big guys. And so there's a little bit of a hole in in the mid tier. So I I feel that as some of the as some of these you know, previously nimble, more agile game studios are acquired by the bigger companies that I do feel like there's going to be a big opportunity for the smaller guys to come in and compete in these mid to hardcore, higher LTV type of game genres. So that's the opportunity that I see. And it'd be great to kind of get some discussion, debate, even, you know, like if, if, even if you completely disagree, it'd be great to get that kind of conversation going. And again, maybe starting with you, Nadav. What do you think? Yeah, I I, I think uh, I, I agree with you. I actually think that okay. uh, and 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 I will connect it to the opportunity that I I'm mm -hmm. going to discuss. But I think that in the next uh, year or two there is a, a definitely a great place for uh, new comers. Let's call them tier two companies that are doing I don't know uh, um, hundred two hundred million dollars a, a year or more than that. The opportunity today together, I think, is, is bigger than before because everything that you said, which I which I fully agree with, and and because of the opportunity that I'm going to discuss in a, in a second. But I can only agree with you. Said. And Ron, what about you as an entrepreneur? What do you think? <laughs> first of all, you know, I have to agree about uh, Dream because I think it's one of the first games that I've spent real money right. in a long time on <laughs> and uh and i know some you know like uh um big people in the vc industry that you know put in like a thousand dollars and more like into the into match royale uh so so that game they really showed i think they 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 were a really big surprise in my eyes um yeah i, I agree as well i guess <laughs> lexi any any thoughts <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for not being uh, more, uh, more, uh, you know. I know I I, I don't want to be uh, just echoing everyone else's sentiments, but I do I do think there's opportunity there um, in in a big way. I think um, you know it creates there's that opportunity for the nimble sort of uh, mid tier players, as you said, to kind of move faster and test ideas. So maybe that's more around innovating around gameplay, where there might just be less fewer hurdles to that actual steps to to testing that out with real users and getting that to market. Um, so that's definitely yeah. uh, definitely an opportunity. I do think the um, so the big budget production of games, uh, as you mentioned, there's like consolidation in the market and that kind of all helps to fund some of these bigger players. But I do think that big budget production still remains like a pretty credible 
sort of not threat, kind of a threat or a risk in a sense right. where, I mean, you've got a lot of money flowing behind some of these really big players. And, and like I mentioned before, if we start to see more studios still migrate to mobile, some of the big PC uh, console, then I could see that there is there is a big opp- uh, a big opportunity for them. But also it's a, it represents that kind of threat to kind of squeezing out some of the smaller players. Um, but like kind of what you said, there's that two sides of the coin. Like that is a risk and that's something that we're seeing. Right. There's a lot of big budget production where you've got really strong um games coming out from those players but at the other side of the coin is that idea of um if you get too big in the sense of the the acquisitions right or there's a lot more of the um uh a little bit of internal red tape what have you that does create that um opportunity in itself to move a bit faster than those guys for sure right well Maybe since you guys agreed with with me so much, maybe I'll disagree with myself a little bit. And, I, I, and so, from from my perspective, I, I, the one danger I do think about with respect to the trend I just mentioned would be, for example, like we haven't seen IDFV play out like it potentially could have yet, but it potentially could. And and also, if walled gardens start to emerge, where you know whether it's companies like AppLovin or Zynga is able to build, you know, and, and in their own ecosystem, including like an advertising layer that just cross promotes within its own network, then I would say that that would be a scenario in which like the smaller guys probably can't compete. But as a, as an entrepreneur, I'm, I'm hoping that scenario doesn't play out. <laughs> but okay, maybe going to the next opportunity, Nadav, what, what, uh, what is your big opportunity for 2020, 2022 and beyond? Yeah, so let's let's uh, be under the assumption that what you described will not happen, that every <laughs> big player will become a closed garden. I actually think that, the and, and it's related to what you said, but from a different angle, I think that the growth opportunities of new studios in 2022 is much, much better than uh, before uh, due to a few reasons. First of all, I think that the... the First of all, which is the easy one, there is much more money, right? It's, it's today, you know, it, when, when you have a initial KPI that shows some potential, you can raise much more money than you could have, uh, I don't know, two years or three years ago, or definitely 10 years ago. So, so there is more money available. But let's, let's leave this aside. I think that everything that related to uh, uh, the growth uh, phase or everything around the game itself, from technology to know how today, is, is much more available for uh, studios in their first stages than before, right? I think, and, and I think that this trend will continue, right? And, and, and this is following the Iron Source and, 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 and Unity and uh, App Lobby and, and, and all these big tech companies that, that, that raise a lot of money and building a lot of tools and technology is, is, is progressing, right? If you, and, and even small services like Luna, which is today part of Iron Source, and, and it helps you to automate your creative production. But, it, but in general, what I'm saying is that I think that everything that is around user acquisition, uh, creative production, and optimization, um, um, even some layers of monetization of the game, are going to be offered in a very, very advanced product uh, with strong technology to studios, much better than a few years ago. And studio that has a very strong uh, uh, game idea, innovative uh, take, uh, core loop, or whatsoever, has higher chances to succeed. Because one of the biggest barrier a few years ago was, okay, even if you have a good game, how do you scale it? How do you... Building a, a strong UA uh, uh, user position, monetization, and creatives like Playwix has was almost impossible for, for a small studio a few years ago. But as, as, as the technology progresses, I think that it would be a, a, a approachable for everyone on a much a more a decent uh, a price that they need to, to pay. And this will allow them to focus on their game and with the money that is raised, I think it's open a big, big opportunity for, for new studios to enter it and to become the next uh, tier two. Then they will probably be uh, or try to be acquired uh, very, very quick, but at least to make the first jump and then decide whether you want to build something that is big by your own or want to, to join one of the big players. But in my eyes, 2022, we'll see more of that. We will see more studios crossing the, I don't know, few dozens of millions of dollars in, of income a year, much more than we saw in 2021 and 2022. Uh, because of that, because of the reason that you mentioned, uh, 
because of the money that is uh, uh, from the industry, which in my eyes is good. It, 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 it adds to the competition, it, 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 it offers more products to the users, more value, it pushes everyone to be better because it's a bit more competitive industry. Um, but, but I think that if I need to guess, we will see in 2022 twice the, the studios that are tier two, dozens of millions of dollars a year and, and more uh, comparing to previous years. Okay, so Nadal, just so I fully understand the opportunity that you're raising, so it, it sounds like what you're saying is that based upon a lot of supporting service capabilities being offered by some of the service providers and based upon technology that smaller studios are going to have a greater capability of being able to scale, of having higher production value games and having previously capabilities that were only available to big guys now available for small guys. And then that will also in turn allow these studios to make a lot more money than they previously could have. Is that basically what you're saying? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Ron, what do you think? Do you agree, disagree? What's your take? So, uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna go for okay. like 50-50 this time. Um, I'm going to first of all agree because I remember uh, in like it was 2012 uh, when we first uh, did the fundraise for Jelly Button and, and like investors looked at us like uh, like literally like aliens <laughs> landed in the meeting room, you know, like you're raising money for mobile game. Like, are you serious? Really? And uh, you, you fast forward. 10 years and and like you know you just come with a slideshow and some like a, the most basic track record and you can raise like two three four million dollars uh, within a month today uh, so a hundred percent in that regards uh, the the landscape has changed a lot there's also lots more uh, professionals and, and people at least in Israel I'm not sure how it is worldwide but uh, um, the, the the developer community has uh, greatly improved uh, the one thing I do think, though, is that while there will be more opportunities to smaller studios, I do believe that due to the increasing costs of UA and the massively increase in um, uh, payrolls and like uh, the, the basic um, uh, terms that uh, people expect when they join your company these days, so it, it's, it's like a double-edged sword. So I think on one hand, it's going to be there's actually room for smaller companies and, and new players to, to get into the market. On the other hand, there's like the, these new problems as well. So, so that's why I'm, I'm like 50-50 on that one. Lexi, what do you think? What is easy today, today to, to build a company from scratch or in 20, 12, uh, 10 years ago, if you compare the pros and cons? Uh, it's a good question. Well, for me, it worked in 2012, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to go with 2012. Uh, but hopefully, hopefully it will work with this one as well. And, you know, in, in like a year or two, you'll ask me that again. I'll say, oh, no, 2021, yeah, for sure. I'm curious about the, um, in terms of the job, like getting the right talent, attracting talent as a smaller studio. I'm curious, uh, 2012 <laughs> versus now, how are you, how is that factoring in? Do you think there's a major shift? I think, I mean, globally we're having, you know, the great resignation, people reconsidering jobs. I mean, we see that in our data where we're seeing a ton of, um, freelance apps where people are looking mm -hmm. for, uh, freelance gigs, maybe if they've, just left, you know, had a reconciling, had a lot of time indoors during COVID to think about their, their lives. Um, I'm just curious, like from that standpoint, how much uh, attracting the right talent factors in, um, in that market where maybe you're raising more capital, but are you able to retain and keep those major players or are they still, are they going to go to big studios? Uh, well, in my opinion, the, the way I, it, again, I'm speaking in Israel, I'm not sure how it is uh, everywhere else, but uh, I heard uh, Silicon Valley is like uh, 100 times crazier, more or less. Uh, but salaries are yeah. through the roof. People expect like the insane uh, uh, compensations and, uh, you know, you're, you're competing with the, you know, like uh, the big guys. It's You need developers eventually. And uh so on the one hand, you know, 10 years ago, you'd be like the only game company, basically, uh, like that That was the case for us, at least. And uh, people will join you because they want to make games. Uh, but on the other hand, you had to train these people because no one had experience, basically. 
Um, but on the other, so so again, sort of a double-edged sword. You have much more people with much more experience and much more um, funding, but on the other hand, you have much stronger competition in regards to um, uh, raising talent. And uh, I'm, I'm going to say that I think the, the biggest impact will be on, on larger companies, actually, uh, because it's, it's much harder for them to scale at the moment uh, compared to like small, medium studios that they, ha they still have this, um, you know, uh, I'll call it sexy appeal of, of like being a startup and you get more options and you get to be part of something new, etc. So, so yeah, that's, yeah. you that's might have more ownership that. too, make more of an impact. Right. Yeah, Nadal, I, I'm, yeah, exactly. I'm probably like Ron in the sense that I, I kind of agree with you and kind of disagree with you. Like, I think longer term, you're probably right. Like, because kind of what you're talking about is like turning the overall development ecosystem more into like a Roblox, where there's just like what Roblox has done today for kids. Eventually, that probably happens on a larger scale. But when I look at some of the development teams today, like, you know, Lexi mentioned Wild Rift, like, that's a huge team, right? Like, over, what, 300 people? Um, some of the shooter game teams in, in China, like, working on, you know, Call of Duty Mobile or PUBG, I mean, they're, they're, they're numbering in the hundreds. So I would say today, probably there's still, like, a barrier. And then I think some of the kind of the secrets to success are probably still kind of tucked away. Like, you know, we mentioned Dream, but Dream came from, you know, uh, I mean, they, they've done it before. They kind of knew the secrets to making a hit game. So, like, I think that not everybody, like, the secrets for the games aren't as well dispersed, but I think over time probably gets to a point where it, it does become quicker in terms of like you have an idea and a small team could just execute and then it scales and everything kind of works out. And then maybe it also depends on genre too. Like, yeah, if you're trying to make Wild Rift or, or a shooter, then you're probably in trouble. But for other games, maybe it's easier. <laughs> but all right. And uh, Dream, uh, Dream is a tiny yeah. team, if I'm not mistaken, right? From my understanding, yeah. They're like uh, 15 okay, people yeah, or I, something. I, I thought it was a little bigger, but you're probably right. Um, all right, Ron, what, what's your opportunity? Um, okay, so um, I think, you know, that, like I said, uh, when we're looking into the market, in, into the third year, into the pandemic, um, like I said, we saw these trends of, you know, people playing more, uh, you know, like all the KPIs basically went up, like across the board, at least from the games I know. Um, and I think we're going to continue to seeing that. Uh, I think that with the increase of, uh, you know, like we, we just touched, uh, the increase of uh, UA and the increase of talent, uh, there's much greater opportunity for uh, games that innovate and rather than people that are trying to, to bust into an uh, existing, uh, you know, a red ocean, as they say. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess that multiplayer is going to grow even bigger. Again, because people are trying to uh, compensate for, uh, you know, not seeing other people. I don't know, depending on where you are and what's the state in, in your country. But uh, people want to be social and, and games and multiplayer is, is a great way of being social. And we've seen that in the past two years. Um, other than that, I'm, I'm feeling that games have been further normalized into the mainstream in the past uh, two years, um, especially on mobile. And... Uh, I'm 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 thinking that the audience is is starting to mature. Like uh, we had like new players or, or or people who just got into games and you know you're stuck in home and you, you just I don't know downloaded some game and started playing it. And as you mature, as in your taste matures, you you start wanting to try more complex things. So I'm I'm guessing that we'll see some growth in the I'm gonna call it like the casual mid core range sort of. You know, we're going to see some shift from casual players that are slightly migrating towards mid-core. Um, and I think uh, the last issue is, uh, again, we talked about, we touched it uh, previously, but NFT games are still, in my opinion, incredibly young. Most of them are, uh, you know, just a, a rushed attempt to, to reach the market as fast as possible. 
And I no. strongly believe that someone will, will crack the coder and find a proper solution, you know, a proper implementation for it. Uh, and I do expect to see like a, like a new player emerge and, and take over the market. That's so if I'm understanding you correctly, Ron, the big opportunity for you would be a social multiplayer crypto NFT type of game. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. What a combo. <laughs> Sounds perfect. All right. Mm-hmm. And somewhere, somewhere between casual Lexi, and Lexi, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I largely, um, I largely agree. I think the, I think it's both the games themselves and the gamers maturing. So we see things like Among Us being a big, big breakout app at the end of last year in 2020 across the globe, um, where it was sort of moving and blurring the lines between like hyper casual esque, like it, it's a bit more. Um, even just the, the user interface, like when you join that app, it's it's not as intense as when you when you open, uh, like we mentioned, Wild Rift before, or even PUBG, um, where it feels more. You can feel it that it's more of a core game, and you're using just your phone as the hardware to facilitate. So I definitely think that that's de- uh, a major thing that's happening where people. Uh, the games themselves, the lines are blurring. So you've got competitive multiplayer techniques in games that might appear on the surface a little bit more hyper casual, um, and that attracts a bit of a broader audience. And then maybe some of the, the game mechanics are scaled back a bit, so they're not as core. So it's it's kind of leading that person a little bit farther along. Um, but it does exactly what Ron was saying, in my opinion. Like it kind of those types of games, it moves people in their mindset. So. Uh, we saw in a huge way um, with Appy Any Data, as I'm sure you guys imagine, like Q2, when lockdowns pretty much globally uh, were really pushing in and people were staying inside. I mean, demand for games went really high up. We saw hyper casual have this kind of like step function, new growth <laughs> that they had. They'd been on a high growth, but it was like it just really shot up. And then you start to see like other games emerging where people, it's almost like that gateway into gaming for a lot of people. And I think people don't consider themselves gamers often. Um, and we saw, you know, older demos kind of dipping their toe into games on mobile in a way that we really hadn't seen as well. Um, and then you see that happening where the adoption and it's, it is more mainstream from a player base. And I think once you've tried maybe a hyper casual game or um, we see that Sudoku and uh, word games are very popular with the above 45 age bracket, for instance, in the US. Um, but once you've tried those, then it's like, the other ones, it, it's more normal. And the same goes for making in-app purchases within those games, as well as in-app subscriptions in non-games. We're starting to see that more mainstream mentality across all those categories where uh, people, you know, they're banking primarily on their phone and all of those little micro interactions on mobile, um, I think, kind of snowball. And then when you go to play a game and you have like so much fun and it's entertaining and you're passing the time, I think they kind of create this feedback loop as a person um, and you you are moving as a more mature mobile user overall, and that leaks into gaming for sure. Um, so I definitely see that there is that, I think you're spot on with the, the, the maturity kind of developing. And last year was like a kind of opening the floodgates a bit, and like people came in that probably would have taken many, many more years or months to kind of dip their toe into the mobile gaming world. All right, Nadav, what do you think? Social... Uh... Multiplayer, casual to mid-core NFT game. What, what's your take? Yeah, I, I actually, I actually, since uh... let's let's open a couple. <laughs> I have that an idea for, for you. We need to do this. I, I actually sit in the middle between what uh, okay. Ron and Lexi said, uh, in the sense that you mentioned uh, uh, the NFT world. I, I I totally agree that uh, with Ron that that we're going to see more uh, casual to to RPG etc. But but let's ignore the NFT world. That who knows how big is it and, and, and what's going to feature in our in our usual world that it as it is today. I'm not 100 percent sure that we will see this transition from casual to to mid core out core mainly because what Lexi said and, and and we see it as well. We see many new users and i think that whatever what what drives the trend at the end of the day is the end user right it's the player is the is the is the person that holds the device and 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 what lexi said is is, is definitely something that we saw that in the past two years um for many reasons because of covid because of the growth of hyper casual which is somewhere in the middle between gaming and social 
and kind of offering an entry stage for non-gamers into the mobile games world, we see that the, the, the amount of, of, of players, let's call them like that, increase significantly and become very, very uh, uh, broad, meaning that it's not really the players that we used to see a couple of years ago. It's, it's everyone. It's your grandma, your father, your daughter, your sister, everyone. And in that sense, I, I, I actually think that instead of going from casual to mid-core, we're going to see more what of, uh, Lexi mentioned uh, under the Among Us umbrella, something that is between hyper-casual to casual, in a sense that that from one from one end it's very very appealing to many many people, right? RPG is appealing to RPG players, but 99% of the people in the world will not play RPG. It won't be appealing for them. Hyper casual are appealing for 70% of the people in the that play games. This is their their nature, and and I think that there is a middle that we will start seeing. We start to see some of this, but but we'll see it growing where uh, uh, games will offer, uh, you need to serve this huge segment of, of people that are not uh, hard uh, and mid-core players, and this segment I think is growing the fastest, uh, and it's becoming, and it's definitely the biggest. And you will, you will need to serve them with, with something that has different offering and quality than hyper-casual, very ad-based uh, games, but on the other end, it's, it's still simple mechanism, uh, uh, straight to the point, uh, uh, very uh, understandable for people that are not uh, heavy players. And, and, and I think that this segment is also going to grow maybe even better, more than everyone in the next uh, year or two, because there is demand for it, and the demand is huge, and it's grew a lot in the past year or two, and, and, and the supply didn't match the demand yet, and, and, and it's only a matter of time, I hope, until will be able to serve this demand with, with, with games, but, but the player's audience is, is increasingly uh, uh, so so much. And, and I think that this is one of the biggest opportunities as well, and one of the biggest trends that we'll see in terms of movement between subgenres or new uh, type of games uh, in the top charts. Okay. And Ron, just to disagree a little bit, or not really disagree, because I actually agree with you, but I, I would say that uh, maybe not, I could speak to the other part of, of your opportunity, which is the NFT part. The The risk that I see with on the NFT side is more around, well, specifically around, I think that there's a risk that maybe one of the popular games, let's say Axie Infinity, the economy and the model, if it doesn't sustain and suddenly collapses, could create a little bit of a scare behind crypto games. And then I also think that when we look at the current funding cycle, and we, we, you know, we know there's a lot of money, we know a lot of crypto games are being funded today. And then as a lot of crypto games come online, and then when we look at the audience of who's, who's like purchasing these NFTs, right? It's like people who early on were, you know, invested early in crypto have a lot of crypto that for them is kind of like play money. This is my speculation, right? And so this is, it's like, they're like gambling with this money and you know, they're not cashing it out because they got to pay tax on it. And so like when they're gambling with this money and, it, and we, we assume it's like, if you were to believe it's a limited audience and I, I mean, new, new people are jumping in all the time and jumping into crypto. But if we think about it from a supply and demand perspective in terms of, well, there's like this base group of people who, who have a lot of crypto, some new people coming in, but then a lot of new crypto games coming online. So one is the potential scare from, you know, one of the popular games having some kind of an issue and then supply and demand in the near term future. I would see those as potential risks, but overall, I would say longer term, I'm, you know, I'm a bull in terms of crypto and NFT. So I would say longer term, I think we're fine, but potentially in the short term, there, there could be a little bit of risk, in my opinion. All right, so last opportunity. Lexi, what do you got? Sure. Um, so I think there's, they kind of all link in. There's a few sub opportunities I was considering, but I think there's like a general theme. Uh, but basically, I think uh, what we've seen historically in the last like 
probably two years and even beyond that is, you know, hyper casual does dominate the downloads charts in terms of getting reach. Uh, but we're seeing indications of there being uh, more greater opportunities for games beyond hyper casual to see that kind of level of mass adoption. Uh, and globally, when we're looking at, you know, even Q3 of this year uh, that just passed, we've got uh, my, my Talking Angela 2, which is like a simulation pet game. That's number one globally. Free Fire and PUBG, number two and four. Subway Surfers, number six. Roblox, number nine by downloads. These are all huge, uh, more core functionality games that are servicing globally, like big demand there alongside, you know, we've got around four hyper casual games as well. Um, so hyper casual there, but there's this bigger opportunity as well, where I think the market is adopting a bit more beyond that too. Um, and then I think that kind of brings us to this metaverse conversation, which I think that that is here to stay. Um, okay. In my opinion, the it kind of reminds me of the initial buzz of VR. Um, I remember so much around the VR and AR specifically kind of coupled. And I'd say what the metaverse world is kind of doing, and I know there's a lot of buzz in the media happening right now with all sorts of companies jumping on, you know, Nike creating yeah. sneakers and all sorts of things. But I think what it does is it, capitalizes on that immersive nature, um, but without the need to have a physical device. And I think the imagination and the fact that you have an accessible device is sort of the key there. Uh, and that's sort of where we're seeing a testament to that is, you know, in the US for Q3, Roblox was number one for downloads, for consumer spend, and for active users. So that's a big testament in the local market in the US. Globally, we also see a huge global appeal. I mean, it's ranking in South Korea, number one for active users, uh, from Brazil to Turkey, uh, markets all over the world. Now, there are unique markets like China and Japan, which I'm sure we all realize, <laughs> you know, very unique, not, not going to have the same apps or games ranking in those. But I think that that's a big testament to the popularity and the ability for this to kind of take hold. Uh, and in my opinion, a bit more in a meaningful way of tapping into that immersive nature um, for getting lost into something in touching on a similar vein from VR. Um, and then I think when you take it one step further, it's also about the connected game. So I think this kind of was talking a little bit about what Ron was saying. Games that foster online communities, that's where I think that's going to be key and a big opportunity. Um, and those are the games, in my opinion, that will have really strong staying power as well, because um, you're using similar uh, the similar user acquisition and adoption techniques that a lot of those big social uh, powerhouses have used, where it's the network effect in action. If your friends are there, um, you get more value as a user because you're with your friends. Um, you know, there is that layer of it being this virtual world um, that from COVID, we've been reshaped and thinking about ways to connect um, more virtually, kind of on an always on. Uh, but I do think that that's where um, you'll start to see that just those online player social networks that, that um, affects in games um, and metaverses and Roblox in particular is one great example of that. So in my mind, that's a huge opportunity is this area for um, imagination and creativity um, and then kind of that intersection with with connected games with be being connected to people and online communities. Okay. And Lexi, just so I understand your definition of the, the, the M word. Uh, so you're saying that <laughs> like, like a metaverse game would be an immersive experience, but you don't necessarily need the, it's not necessarily VR. So you don't necessarily need the headset. Is that how you're defining it? Or just, just so I understand. We're looking at the, at, yeah, we're looking at metaverses around, um, you know, there is, uh, it is an immersive experience in the sense of you're creating your own world and there's that social element as well with being social with other people. Okay. Um, I will say I'll stop short of having a formal definition from, from our okay. company because I think that that's something we're seeing. Um, metaverse, metaverse apps are emerging in the gaming category. They're typically among simulation genres is what we're seeing on the app any side. Right. And then we're also seeing not even in the gaming category at all. Categorized as something, a non-game from the App Store right. categorization. So, so may, uh, but maybe it's if I were to... creating worlds together. Right. Okay. So maybe if I were to interpret that, it's like not necessarily having to have the hardware, but an experience that potentially involves a world in a shared experience. So something like a Roblox, something like a, a Fortnite or something like that. Is that... Would that be? Yep, Minecraft. Okay. Um, yep, something like a Minecraft or Zepetto okay. is another one we've seen in South Korea. 
Okay. Nadav, what do you think? Ah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard question. From one end, I, I, I understand with Lexi in, in, uh, and, and, and I agree with the concept. Uh, what, what we didn't see lately is any new players in this field, right? So except of uh, Minecraft or Roblox, uh, that none of them are, are young or came lately. Not, I, I, I'm not aware of anyone that managed to create this kind of uh, environment or experience uh, uh, lately, and I wonder why, if it's, if it's related to, to the complexity of it or, 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 or related to the need, because you would expect, right, seeing uh, Roblox success, you would expect uh, to see much more players try to take market share uh, under this umbrella, right, uh, which, which is similar to what Lexi uh, described, but, but maybe I missed, I personally didn't see any uh, trying to, to or, or managing to scale and, and, and the question is why, whether it's too complex or maybe there is not enough need or maybe it's too hard to, comp to compete with Roblox now uh, uh, so late. And, and what will the metaverse change? Because if, if, if you speak at the, at the metaverse in, in, in a sense of a, a either hardware or, or NFTs and virtual experience, then, then me I, I definitely think that it, we are going to go during the three to five years uh, range. But if you speak at metaverse in a sense of what we know today as, as Roblox, etc., I think it it's provides very unique value proposition to user, definitely today after the COVID and everything. But on the other end, I didn't see anyone managing to offer a new product and take market share in this area lately. So, so I'm not sure how, how much will it, it change next year. Ron, what do you think? Um, you know, I, I, I still, you know, <laughs> thinking about uh, what you said, uh, Lexi, comparing it to VR and AR. Uh, I, from the beginning, like when I saw VR emerging and AR emerging, I was much a stronger believer in AR because I felt like uh, VR was too cumbersome and people, you know, they come back from work or school and they want to chill out and, and play and not stand around and, you know, be isolated and, uh, so the physical barrier for me is, uh, I think, it's still too high, and um, and there's always the problem like the chicken and the egg. Like you, you don't have products, so you don't get consumers, but you don't have consumers, so you don't get new products. Like in the VR space, at, at least. So the metaverse will be interesting to see uh, because it's uh, backed by such a huge company. Uh, so it's it's going to be very interesting to see what they'll do there, uh, and. Obviously, you know, user-generated content is by far the best model that there is. Like, if you can pull it off, it's, it, it, it's you know, like magic. Um, so, so I'm like, uh, again, I'm like uh, somewhere in between Nadav and uh, Lexi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And well, one thing I really liked, Lexi, is that you have, um, I kind of like the way you describe the metaverse because I, I would say that there's so many definitions of the metaverse, but the, the one in which, you know, the, if, if we were to think about it as like some kind of virtual world plus shared experience, then that makes a lot more sense to me. You know, I, I would say that, you know, recently I, I think the Stratechery guy was describing the metaverse as internet plus VR. And to me, that doesn't make as much sense because, you know, well, just, just to give you a personal experience, one, one of my, uh, my, I have a young son and, you know, he saved up money to buy the new Oculus VR thing. And I think he got it a few weeks ago and I think he used it for two hours and he hasn't touched it since. And so I, and so Ron, <laughs> to your point, I, I think if, you know, like VR, if VR is like an integral aspect of this metaverse opportunity or a metaverse game of some kind, then I, I, I think it's probably going to be difficult. But so I kind of agree with actually, I'm very similar to you, Ron. I agree with Nadav and Lexi. Like Lexi, I think that some kind of like shared shared world experience is a huge opportunity. We've seen it with Roblox. We've seen it with Minecraft. You know, we've seen it with, with Fortnite and like the, the concert experiences that they have. But I also agree with Nadav that like building that is incredibly difficult. Like, you know, I mean, Roblox started in like 2000 six or something like I forgot how long ago and Minecraft started a long time ago 
and and so I, I I think the the opportunity is huge, but also the barrier to entry and the difficulty is probably huge as well. All right. Well, I, I think we nailed four opportunities for 20, 2022 and beyond. And so I thought we could then shift to risks and I'll, I can start. And so for me, the big risk heading into 2022 and beyond is, is really around kind of data privacy and something that I call the data wars of 2020. And basically the thinking is really around kind of like what's been happening when we, and you know, Nadav, you're probably familiar with all the data stuff happening, like with IDFA and just sharing of information and kind of some of the stuff that that's kind of popped up with app and things like that. But like, if we have, you know, walled gardens, or if we have um, ad networks that consolidate a huge part of the ad supply in the ecosystem, then, you know, I, I think that, uh, game studios are going to start to have to make decisions about, you know, what ad networks to use, how, you know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, on the ad monetization side as well, what data is shared. And so, like, I think that the big risk that I see is the sharing of data and how the ecosystem pl kind of plays out <laughs> and and how much risk a company potentially could be with sharing their information. But what do you think, Nadav? <laughs> and uh, you know, feel, feel free not to get yourself into any trouble. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll just say that uh, that in general, I think that there is a, there is there is a very good solution to offer a, a granular uh, optimization, which allows you to optimize your business to the most without hurting the uh, privacy or without hurting the uh, competition or, or anything you mentioned. Um, I, I personally think that, you know, since iOS 14, we, we started a transition uh, phase and, and, and it's fine. Not everything is as smooth and as perfect when you're changing something, but, but in the long term, I personally less concerned about it. I think, I think that, I think that, the the right solution will be found both on uh, both on uh, iOS and Android, both between networks and, 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 and advertisers, because it's not an impossible task to solve, and there is a need to solve it, like you said, and it's it's a huge market, and 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 I think that we'll be able to build the the right infra, infra and the right uh, uh, processes, even if it's not the first shot that Apple uh, uh, tried, even if it will be the second or the third. We'll be able to build the right uh, methodology in order to allow fully optimi optimi optimization of your business because you don't want to hurt your business, right? You don't want to to hide data and pay the price of of, of, of cutting, I don't know, quarter of your UA. And you don't want to uh, uh, do anything that will hurt your business. You just want to optimize it the best way possible without taking unnecessary risks or without hurting users' uh, 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 privacy. And I think that. We solved much more complicated things than that, uh, and 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 our industry is so big that I'm really really uh, confident that that the the infra will allow people to to keep growing their business without being worried about uh, data. Again, maybe it will take uh, uh, some time until we we'll get there, but but we we will get there. Ron, what do you think? Um. You know, I think it's a very good, very interesting topic. Um, personally, I, I, I don't feel that there's, you know, the data privacy is more like a veneer of a reason for Apple to do it. It's more about keeping the data for themselves. Uh, I saw in the latest report that uh, um, the, the revenues generated by uh, paid uh, Apple search ads tripled yeah. in the last quarter, something like that, which is you know, obvious since they are the only ones that have the data on the, the users. So uh, they're the best place to advertise. And I think that's, you know, eventually that that's what's driving these companies to, to data uh -huh. privacy. and Yeah, Ron, maybe um, I could clarify. 
and as well, oh, I, sorry, I heard sorry, Ron, about. I, I, was, I, was, I, I, I just wanted to sort of clarify what I meant by kind of like the data wars and kind of the data privacy issues, and it's it's more around let let's say there's like a vertically integrated, you know, game studio plus ad networks, similar to what Zynga, you know, with their recent acquisitions and mm -hmm. what they're trying to do. But like, let's if Zynga yeah. owns the ad network, and then you as a competitive company are using their ad network and they see all your bids and they see the creatives that you're running and they see the volume and scale yeah. of what you're doing and then mm -hmm. any other you know info that you send back then they could potentially use that to compete against you and so what that essentially does then is it starts to turn like UA people or admon teams as kind of like the data strategists of a default data strategist of a company where you know they're making calls in terms of um, you know, potentially sensitive data that could potentially risk, you know, competitive behavior by some of these vertically integrated types of companies. That that that's the risk that I, that I mean. Not and probably less so on the Apple side. Oh, I got it. Got it. Uh, so on that regards, I think uh, what happened with uh, Justin Applavin mm -hmm. is a great example because uh, you know I I know that lots of uh, developers pretty much uh, jump chipped as soon as it happened because right. uh, you know app loving and um, and uh, so in that regards I think I agree with you Lexi any thoughts I mean I think the big thing for um, for app Annie that we've seen I mean we've seen an intra increased interest in this sort of the market level data as well so I think when people were not able to go as deep with the insights on, you know, who's playing what game um, and like using that for strategic targeting. I think what we've really seen is there's been an increase in just wanting to know the market at that kind of higher level. So taking a step back and it's not necessarily as granular, um, but it gives you that great indication. And, you know, for example, some data we were just looking at um, for uh, gender and age for specific uh, subgenres of games and found it really interesting that in the U.S., uh, slots casino games um, skewed very, uh, a lot older. They skewed to the 45 and above bracket, but then much more female by a long shot. Whereas in the U.K., slots casino is skewing very male. Um, so those types of insights where it's very market level, um, I think that those are interesting, especially from the standpoint of advertisers um, and marketing. It's not going to be, obviously, it's granular um, and to your point about, you know, data wars with uh, what has happened in integrations and how these walled gardens might come up. I think it is an, it is an interesting th uh, idea to consider as far as the, the, the opportunities in this space in 2022. I think it's going to be interesting. I'm really curious about what happens with um, any sort of data sharing. Um, if there's people in the industry that start, you know, collaborating so they can have a bit more granular views, but when you own the ad network as well, I think that that's a, yeah, there's pluses and minuses to that situation. And obviously what it was a strategic call from these, uh, these players that, you know, if you can own the ad network, at least you get access to more of this information. And it's an interesting space. I don't know if I have a strong opinion on where we're going to go. I think what we saw last year was that we were, people were really nervous and we, we didn't really see a huge impact in any of the games from our side of, of like a major inflection point. Um, in terms of some of the implications, but uh, we did see just, you know, an increase from people looking for some of those insights that they wouldn't be able to get. And it was more market level. It wasn't going to be as granular. Um, yeah. All right. Nadav, big risk, 2022 and beyond. What, what's your big risk? Yeah. So first of all, I'm optimistic. So, so I think that the opportunities are much bigger than the risks, but... Uh, but but very very big macro risk. I think that what we need to be uh, uh, to make sure that it doesn't happen uh, is that quick money will make us uh, mediocre. Uh, and and I'm saying it in the sense that I think that the industry is going through a huge transition that started uh, a year ago, two years ago with the consolidation, uh, and and now it's NFT. And, and, and I think that more and more new gaming companies that uh, come up see their uh, future as a two-year trip. Uh, 
right? Because uh, today it can be two months trip because uh, if, if, if in the past you were, you were building a company and building it for quite a few years and building something massive, today if you have good KPIs, you probably get 10 acquisition offers in, in, in when you are one year old. Uh, uh, and with NFT today, you can probably be ROI on the investment after uh, one month. Uh, so, and, and and I think that there is risk in this. Uh, in 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 this, uh, I think that uh, it's great that, that 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 there is a lot of money, but this money can help this industry to step up, or or make this industry also make a step down. Because if if this uh, big amount of money will make half of the new companies a very short term companies that are just looking to make their their hit their 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 earning uh, uh, very very fast it will it will reduce the level of the of the of the quality of everything that we are building so i think it's a risk i think that uh, sometimes it can be a very a lot of background noise right uh, you can uh, raise five million dollars on a on a 10 slides of nft game and then to to go out with the currency and then to make your money and go home after a, a few months or you can build an MVP, have good KPI, start scaling, making 10K a day, and then be acquired by someone, then you don't care about it anymore. Um, and, and, and I think that we will see less and less companies that are actually building something that is going to be big from the very, very first stage. Uh, and, and, and we need this uh, uh, segment because this is what will push the industry more and more. So, so this is uh, one of the biggest risks in my eyes. So we won't get confused with, with all the money that is going around the industry in the past year and still uh, uh, build something that will be here for, for a couple of years and, and, and take this industry and make it grow as it grew in the past 10 years because this is why it grew. This is one of the reasons why it grew because of the lot of uh, great players that entered and, 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 and brought huge value to the market. Okay. Ron, what do you think? Um. Well, I, I I sort of have to agree since uh, I'm I'm here to build a company for the long run and not uh, just a cash grab. <laughs> so, hundred uh, percent agree. You know, I'm with you. Um, I think it's it's always been a part of the industry. You know, but in general, for people who, who hear about some sort of uh, you know a gold rush and and today it's NFT. Uh, tomorrow it's I don't know what. You know, something on the metaverse and like all these. Uh, invest like um, uh, dumb money. We call it in Israel. I'm not sure what's the the correct term in uh, English. You know, money from outside yeah. of gaming that they don't understand, and yeah. they push all this money into the pool. And um, so, so I think in that regards, it's something that will always be there and always has been. It's just like because all the the entire market has scaled, it it looks much bigger as well. So I'm not I'm not sure how much of a risk it is because I I only see like the industry continuing to grow when not taking a single step back in my opinion. Lexi, what do you think? I think I share a lot of Ron's sentiments. I do think the growth is there, and I think when it comes to games, the appetite for new games is quite strong. Uh, we we do see tons of movement in the top charts for games on a weekly basis, daily basis. Um, and I think the real thing, uh, I, I can't remember who said it before, but at the end of the day, the players will make a lot of the decisions. And when people play a good game, I think that that's, that's your biggest asset. Um, uh, and, and kind of to your point, Nadav, you know, that's your biggest asset in terms of those KPIs that might even get you the funding to keep going. But it's those players that play the games and how good it is and how... Um, innovative it is and capturing those people um, is the biggest uh, vote in all of it, I think. Um, and we see a lot of a lot of movement, a lot of diversity and the games that are kind of coming in. And then it's it becomes to me a question more of are you a flash in the pan or are you able to keep that momentum and and to retain those users over time? Um, that's where we see a lot of a lot of uh, games come and go quickly um, if they're not able to kind of capitalize and keep that going. So to me, that's where um, probably the, that feedback loop that feeds right back into proving those quality KPIs to get that funding that's readily available, which is kind of an awesome situation for the gaming market to be in. <laughs> Have all yeah. this interest and big players looking at the space. 
Yeah. And Nadav, I, I personally agree with you. And I think there's actually kind of like two aspects to what you're saying, if, if I'm understanding you correctly. The first part is the part that Ron spoke to, which is like, you know, are, are people just going for the cash grab, which would then kind of potentially ha have a risk of everyone going for the same thing and then resources get deployed against too many people doing the same thing. But then I also think that the other risk in terms of the money is like, I do actually think that some companies can have too much money. And, you know, just from my own experience running, you know, uh, the, my game com studio, I, I do feel that with too much money, you start to lose discipline. And then also, you know, if, if I'm seeing my bank balances go down every month because, you know, we're, we just don't have a lot of money, then that just creates a lot of pressure. And, but I think it's a pressure that's kind of required to make hard decisions, to figure out how to deploy resources appropriately, to make, you know, decisions about if someone's not performing, you know, you, you just, all these things that are required to, to, to actually achieve the success. So I, so I would agree with you kind of on both sides of the money situation in terms of having people chase too much in one direction and allocate resources in a potentially suboptimal way in the industry and then just in terms of the company execution as well. So de de definitely agree. All right, next risk, Ron. Yeah, so um, for me, I personally think like the, the biggest issue uh, that's more or less been talked about for the past, I don't know, year or year and a half or so is like the, the next major financial crisis that is uh, around the corner. Um, you know, n nobody knows when it's going to happen. Uh, everybody knows it's going to happen. Uh, I, I think I heard something like that. The money in the past two years that was printed, something it was like doubled than the money that was in existence. Uh, so we're, that's what we're seeing. So many investments going into everywhere and uh, people going crazy. And I think as soon as like we'll see the first domino uh, fall there, uh, we'll see investments uh, basically running out and uh, investors, you know, going into their uh, fallout shelters and waiting to see the damage, basically. Uh, and in that regards, you'll see a lot of companies that I'll, I'll connect this to Nadav uh, that went for the cash grab and just went into it, you know, to raise money and try to do it and blah, blah, blah. And then when they don't have this next investment because they don't have a real product or good KPIs or anything like that and, and the investments died up, we'll see a lot of companies closing down, uh, which will further decrease uh, investments in the field. Uh, and I particularly expect to see this in uh, the NFT space as well, like I said, because it's like, I think it's the most obvious, uh, you know, gold rush uh, market uh, at the moment and the most uh, heavily funded one as well, like in, in, like in a non-proportional way. Um, yeah. Lexi, GFC, global financial crisis, what do you think? <laughs> oh, big booming question. Um, I think... My first thought goes back to um, what we saw in COVID where uh, there was a lot of financial insecurity, I think, in the market where people weren't sure, like, is this about to shut everything down? A lot of nerves. Um, and we saw that mobile was really resilient um, just in terms of that market. We actually saw that some of that um, the economic headwinds funneled people into other areas. And actually, crypto was a big one that we're still seeing huge gains in where people we're just interested in that market for the first time um, as a result. So, I mean, I think it's really hard to say, especially with the, with a looming financial crisis uh, on the horizon. I don't think anyone predicted the, you know, the crisis of at least the, the pandemic last year. Well, people I'm sure did. There were sure <laughs> warning signs about a pandemic at some point. Um, but I think um, what, mobile, I think offers what is, mobile offers is ultimately we saw just a lot of really strong companies and emerge and we saw people turn to mobile ultimately more we saw and more. Just a lot of really um, strong companies emerge. To your point and before, we saw Joe, strong about how emerge, and um, we saw in those circumstances, strong companies uh, where and cash we runs up in terms of investment more, more and more, um, um, that's where you, you do start to make hard more. decisions and you get um, scrappy. And any one of us involved point, in, a, in an early stage startup would have felt um, that in a real way. Um, 
and that there there's that flip side of opportunity, opportunity where, where you start to see um a bit, a bit more, more of that, that organic, organic innovation, innovation that's, that's not flooded by, by cash, cash just just kind of, kind of hard decisions and thinking critically about how to make big stretch and how to get, to get to the next level, level. Um, um, that's, that's where, where you can start, start to see that bubble up, up. Um, um you know, you know fingers, fingers crossed, crossed we don't, we don't have, have a serious crisis in the whole corner but Understand, understand that that, that is, is yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the economic, economic indicators, indicators are, are, are certain, certain times, times in that regard. regard. All right, Nadal. Uh, I don't know if and and when will it happen, but uh, I think that uh, uh, for sure, when there is a crisis, uh, the activity level goes down. Down, uh, but uh, again, if if I take the optimistic approach here. Uh, what we saw, at least in the COVID, because because February, January was a mini crisis, right? Everything went down, like, a, I think even S&P 500 went down like 30%. But but what we see versus 2008 is that it climbed back uh, as fast as it went down. So, yeah. so I don't know, I, I'm not an economist in my uh, <laughs> profession yet, but, but many say that today... <laughs> Everything is going to be more aggressive the next crisis, so everything will go down very, very fast, but will recover very, very fast versus uh, 2008, uh, that everything went down slow and then went uh, uh, back up uh, very, very slow. And in that sense, I think that even if it will happen, even if it will happen next year or the year before, after or whenever, I, I think it will be a, maybe a short black window that activity will go down and people will be a bit more concerned for a short while. But but I really hope that it won't be a meaningful risk that will harm the industry because it will very recover very, very fast and allow all of us to go back to the activity that we know today. If, again, if we look at the beginning of the COVID, uh, who would have dreamed that after the 30% uh, decrease, you will see... 150% increase in, in one year. Uh, yeah. I, I buy such crises every year, if, uh, <laughs> if uh, possible, but yeah. yeah. So yeah, Ron, I actually agree with you that this is a risk, not, not so much in terms of the market, right? Like I, th- I think we discussed before that players, if there is a crisis, you know, entertainment, so like mobile gaming entertainment so cheap, they'll probably play it. But from a funding perspective, I definitely agree with you. And just, you know, like my own game studio, we weren't scheduled to be raising this early, but we decided well, we should probably raise a little earlier, <laughs> just in case. And when you, yeah, yeah, yeah. and like problem. you know, like reading in the news, Warren Buffett's got the most cash he's ever had at this point, and you see like all these rich guys doing these long short pair trades. So like people are definitely expecting something. But yeah, I also agree with you, Nadav, that hopefully we've got so much money printed that if there's a dip, then we just kind of you know, <laughs> right through it eventually. But <laughs> uh, from the perspective of like not wanting to, like as a game studio, when, when you think about the strategy of your company and thinking about, you know, is it, is, is it, if, you know, it, it's, it's like the, the, the VC saying, right? When dinner's being served, sit down and eat. So like if you can get some money, go get some money. So I, I agree with you on that. All right. So j- just to wrap it up, I think we have one more risk. Lexi, do you want to, Take us home with the last risk that we will discuss. Sure. Um, I think I kind of alluded to one in the beginning about um, some of the user acquisition costs and retention. I think that that's always a risk within mobile gaming is, you know, uh, the the trade-off between how much money you're going to funnel into your game to get for those high, sometimes very high user acquisition costs versus the potential uh, retention that you can have of how you keep those people. Um, And that is always, I don't think, I don't think that's going to go away. Um, I'm curious how it evolves in the coming landscape. Um, but basically, I think, you know, understanding more about which subgenres of gaming even uh, have higher retention, and maybe that helps balance out some of your portfolio if you consider diversifying some of your games into those that might have a little bit longer uh, retention strategies. And that's where I think market data can kind of help in that regard. But ultimately, it, that is a big risk, I think, um, that probably, I mean, it's been there for a while. It's, I don't think it'll go anywhere, but th- that balance of how you keep people, how much you spend for UA, ultimately that kind of uh, value exchange that they receive and how you keep them going in your game. I think that that's, uh, that's never going <laughs> to unfortunately not be there for many game pubs. And and I think the, the higher acquisition cost is a bit of a risk for the smaller players too, where how you break in um, in that regard. Nadav, what do you think? 
Yeah, you know, as, as Lexi said, it's a, con- a constant risk that, that was always there and will always be there. And, and, and the way that I see it, when, uh, if, if I got Lexi right, and, and it's mainly a risk for uh, newcomers, let's say, more than, uh, more than others, but I think that it's, it's, it's a race, right? It's a race because on one end there is the, uh, the risk that Lexi presented that, that probably every year we would see the average CPI goes up, right? Because, because the big guys are getting better and better and their game's getting better and better and their optimization is better and better. So, so CPIs go up on the other end. Of the, on, the, on, on the other end, uh, uh, the question is how big the industry is growing, how much more players are available out there, which constantly growing so far, and, and how many other aspects are being equalized, right? And it's kind of related to the opportunity that I presented before. Uh, doing UA and creatives very, very well, three years ago, a small studio had no chance to get even close to what the big guys are doing in terms of user acquisition. Even if they have the same retention number, the same LTV, the same everything, just because the level of user acquisition creative and everything of the big guys is so, so high, then the small guys had no chance. If, if once, once it will be a bit more equalized because of the technology, because of the products that are available today or next year versus a few years ago, it, it eliminates some of the advantage and, and it, it takes everything and bolts down everything to the LTV and, the, and, and, and CPI. So it's a race between the strong products that are only getting better and can allow themselves to be more aggressive versus the increase of the industry and the technology that is matching some elements of the business and automating some elements of the business to create an equal condition in that sense. And, and I guess that every year we'll see someone else winning a bit in this race and it will change from year to year. But uh, I hope that in the big picture it will balance each other and, and, and will allow uh, uh, others to enter uh, just like we saw so far. Okay, Ram, what, what's your opinion? Uh, I'm going to echo uh, Nadav and Lexi. Uh, you know, I think it's uh, CPI is, uh, it's always, uh, every year is harder and harder to, to compete because uh, like, like Nadav said, the top guys are getting better at what they do and, and gain more um, a stronghold on their position. Uh, but you know, I'll, I'm I'm gonna connect it to my point. I think like if there will be a, a financial crisis and maybe we're gonna see actually the UA prices go a little bit down, you know, because I think it's part of the bubble as well, in my opinion. Um, so so I'm I'm like uh, I'm like a bit hopeful in that regard for that risk, but 100% uh, uh, agree that CPI is increasing is always a risk. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I'll also agree with you, Lexi. I do think that, you know, with the inability to kind of track anymore, and there, I think there's a view on UA that w- with the loss of IDF, you know, with IDFA deprecation, that there's UA teams are going to need to build very expensive data science teams and do do a lot of fancy stuff with like mixed media modeling and a bunch of other stuff. There's an alternative views that suggest it'll be much simpler, but I would say it's a risk in, in the sense that we're not 100% clear in terms of what the impact to user acquisition is and whether with the loss of the ability to properly, you know, attribute spend how that impacts different genres of games and um yeah and to your point just just a shout out to app annie I, I i think being able to get additional data in in the face of lack of you know the ability to attribute and things like that i i think is is going to become valuable but okay so i i we we got through it guys so four opportunities four <laughs> risks and so maybe just as a final parting message and for, for people out there in the audience to be able to get in touch with you, um, if you have any final words, starting with you, Nadav. Um, I think that the industry cannot be in a better place than what it is today, <laughs> although okay. the risks, I think that the opportunities are really 100 times uh, bigger. And, and I think that it's, uh, it, it's an opportunity to be part of this uh, industry. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be there. And, and I think that everyone should join and enjoy this crazy ride and, and growing uh, place to be. Okay, Ron? 
And anything you can tell us about your company? Um, oh yeah, sure. Uh, so it's called Sneaky Panda. We're gonna do uh, new um, mid-core experiences for mobile, uh, like only innovative stuff, no uh, no okay. clonings. Uh, so uh, expect to see uh, social multiplayer NFT. Um, I'm, I'm gonna say that <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I know it. It's like a casual, casual mid-core <laughs> somewhere between there. Uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. But um, I think, uh, you know, it's it's really interesting because the question asked, Alexi asked before, like the difference between uh, 2012 and 2022. I think on one hand, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a much larger market. There's much more opportunity and much more, um, you know, interest. But on the other hand, there's much more competition and... Right. and like things are like if if you're not it's it, I think the the for newcomers like complete newcomers to join the fi the the field is is going to be a problem but for people who are like you know like mid mid term in there and like small players they they still have room to to explode. Okay, and Lexi. I mean, I think it's been kind of fun. All of us are pretty optimistic about the industry, despite some of the risks. So, um, I mean, I'll echo that sentiment throughout. I am pretty optimistic as well. Um, it's a really fun time to be in mobile. Um, looking at Appian data every day, we're just seeing such interesting growth trends and new areas emerge. Like, it's it's pretty fascinating. Um, so, I work for Appian as well. Um, I encourage, if you're interested in just monitoring the market movement and seeing how any of these indicators might play out, anyone can make a free account um, or you can read our reports. We write a lot of them. Um, and it's really, it's really fascinating at least to be just on the cusp of some of the most innovative spaces because it's touching everything, you know, and gaming is such a early adopter in the field. Um, it's a really fun time, I think, to be a part of this, this ride too. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for your time, thoughts and insights. And with that, to the audience, we'll catch you next time. Thanks, everybody. All right, bye.